If you downloaded a gimmicky timer app that gave you less than three days to live, and other people who downloaded it started dying exactly when it predicted, what would you do? Have you ever wanted to know exactly how much time you have left on Earth? It turns out there's an app for that, and it works a little too well. Apparently, Hell has a dev team, and their algorithm is a lot more reliable than YouTube's. I'm gonna break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the killer app in Countdown. These teens are about to download their own deaths. While enjoying a wild night of cheap beer and bad decisions, a group of teenagers stumble upon an unusual cell phone app that poses a simple question. If you could know exactly when you were going to die, would you want to know? Among the young friends, the answer is a resounding yes, all except for Courtney, who's creeped out by the very idea. A little peer pressure is all it takes to bring her around, and she reluctantly pulls up the app, known simply as Countdown. After blowing by the terms and conditions, she arrives at her prognosis, three hours and 37 minutes. Fast forward a few hours and Courtney's boyfriend Evan staggers up to his Jeep to drive them both home. Seeing he can barely even get his key in the ignition, Courtney suggests they walk back instead. Evan won't have it, attributing her perfectly rational fear of riding with a drunk driver to the stupid app she downloaded earlier. He swears he won't get her killed, but Courtney puts her foot down and refuses to stay in the vehicle. Like a true gentleman, Evan pouts at her commitment to self-preservation before speeding off to let her walk home alone in the middle of the night. Just then, Courtney gets a notification from the countdown app, claiming she broke the user agreement. According to the counter, she now has less than eight minutes to make her peace with the universe. Courtney reaches her front door with less than two minutes to spare. Courtney turns off her phone and goes to the bathroom sink for a glass of water. Some rustling in the shower prompts her to pull back the curtain, but seeing nothing unusual, she goes back to the task of hydration. Strangely enough, the shower curtain seems to close back up all on its own. Courtney's phone comes back to life, with a final scream from the app. She turns to find just eight seconds left on the counter when an unseen force Sam fishers her up into the ceiling. With mere seconds remaining, Courtney falls headfirst onto the bathtub below, slumping over dead just as the clock reaches zero. Elsewhere, at that same moment, Evan's Jeep is smashed head on into a tree. As he looks around dazed and bleeding, he discovers a huge branch jammed through the passenger seat. Looks like the app has already claimed its first victim, leaving us with only five left on the board. Evidently, God didn't put too many points into Courtney's intelligence skill tree. It doesn't exactly take a brain surgeon to realize this app should probably be avoided. Anyone who has ever seen an after-school special should know that peer pressure is never a good reason to do anything, even something as seemingly harmless as downloading a cell phone app. For all we know, this thing could be a crypto miner or straight-up malware. If it was from the Google Play Store or Apple Store, okay, maybe, but I don't know what Backpage App Store this is. Just as Courtney is about to install, we can can see that the app has received an average rating of 3.6 out of 5 stars. Pretty high for a shitty timer that kills people. It would definitely be worth skimming through a few of the reviews to see if any genuine deaths are reported in connection with the app. You could even run some of the names through Legacy.com to see the official obituaries of the deceased. Obviously, no one expects this app to be legit, but even if it's just a random number generator with a timer, it'd still be nice to know that you're not agreeing to have your organs harvested in the terms of service. I get that next to no one actually bothers to read these things, but it's probably worth your time, especially when downloading a sketchy app you've never heard of. If you're a curious cat, you can actually download a real countdown app like 10 million other dumbasses. I'm pretty sure it won't kill you, but it's buggy, seizure-inducing, and full of ads. No hate. Demons gotta get that bag somehow with all the inflation, and I'm sure gas prices in hell aren't any better than they are up here. Forget the countdown, though. Courtney needs to reprioritize what she's afraid of. Jesus, downloading an app has you sweating bullets, but you still hop into a car with a stumbling drunk? Yeah, Denzel Washington might have been able to barrel roll a 747 into a wedding ceremony without knocking over the cake, but mixing motor vehicles and booze is a great way to land yourself and others in a mortuary. I'd offer to drive, but it doesn't seem like Evan would be willing to hand over his keys. I would have gone back to the party and sought out someone to walk with me, preferably a group. We might even be able to score a ride back with someone who actually wants to see 30. Better yet, with how anxious she is about the app, she should just stay with a friend or hang out at the party. Going home to a dark, empty house to watch your death clock run out doesn't seem wise, and worst case scenario, you'll want some witnesses around to keep your 
killer from racking up a body count unnoticed. The fact that she clearly would have died had she ridden with Evan is a disturbing coincidence, especially when paired with the countdown app. We don't know for sure that the tree branch went through the windshield at the exact moment the clock struck zero, but that is certainly what's being implied. Unfortunately, Courtney pulled the shortest straw out of her friend group, and with only three hours to contemplate her situation, she wouldn't have been able to invest too much time researching the app's legitimacy or ways to possibly change her fate. I guess we can't cheat death. Or can we? Sometime later, nursing intern Quinn makes her rounds delivering meals to various patients around the hospital. Much to her frustration, one of the beds is empty, prompting her to investigate an off-limits area of the facility currently undergoing renovations. At the far end of a dingy corridor, Quinn finds Evan beside an open window sporting a leg cast. Quinn assumes he's nervous about his surgery tomorrow, but Evan produces his phone to show her the countdown app, citing the 19 hours and 43 minutes remaining as the source of his anxiety. He goes on to explain that the app knew his girlfriend, the late Courtney, was meant to die beside him in the car accident, and even though she opted not to go with him, she still died regardless. After taking him back to his room, the senior nurse orders Quinn to follow her. At first, the young intern assumes the worst, but it turns out to be a surprise party celebrating her status as a full-fledged nurse. As the healthcare workers share some cake, two of them argue over whether one's overconsumption of sweets will put them in an early grave. Quinn chimes in, claiming that there's an app for that. Dr. Sullivan and one of the other nurses eagerly download the countdown app to uncover their respective fates. Just then, a desperate man emerges from the elevator, carrying an unconscious woman. The staff quickly rush to her aid and determine she's OD'd. Without hesitation, they administer a shot of Narcan, bringing her back from the brink before she could punch out for good. Following the ordeal, Quinn ends her shift for the day and heads home. As she waits for the elevator, she goes through her messages to find a group text linking to the countdown app. Unfazed by Evan's account from earlier, Quinn casually clicks through and enters her information, accepting the terms of service without so much as skimming them first. Much to her horror, Quinn's countdown shows only two days, 22 hours, and 37 minutes. The next day, Evan sits petrified awaiting a surgical procedure relating to his injuries. He stares down at the counter on his phone, shows only three minutes remaining. Instead of meeting his fate head on, Evan decides to make a break for it. As he crutches his way to the exit, his phone screeches with a notification from Countdown. User agreement broken. Evan looks up to a nearby safety mirror to find a cloaked figure standing motionless behind him. The unknown entity suddenly darts across the hallway, sending him scrambling into a nearby stairwell. Just then, the lights go out all around him, and he hears a door open several floors below, followed by the sound of footsteps rapidly ascending the stairs. Terror he tries to go back the way he came, but the door to the stairwell seems to have locked behind him. The footsteps stop momentarily, only to reappear right beside him. Slowly, he scans the darkness with his phone light to find Courtney, only she's not quite herself. Five floors down, Evan's phone clatters to the ground as the last few seconds run out. Just as the clock hits zero, Evan's head meets the bottom step with a meaty smack. Two down, four to go. Wow, Grim Reaper sure likes drop testing people's skulls. Let's start with Evan's story. There's no way Evan could have known that Courtney died at the exact same moment he crashed into the tree, but the fact that it still happened on the same night is too strange to ignore. The way she died is hardly something anyone would write off as a mere accident. The coroner would have easily been able to determine that her skull hit the bathtub with considerably more force than if she had simply fallen. It's not like anyone would have assumed Courtney was yeeted across the room by a satanic smartphone app, but she sure as hell didn't slip on a banana peel. Foul play would have almost certainly been suspected, and depending on Evan's relationship with her parents, this is something he likely would have been made aware of. Knowing all this, why would he even download the countdown app in the first place? As far as he could tell, it was one for one on death predictions. I guess he could have been looking for answers surrounding his girlfriend's death, but this seems like more of a Google search than something you try out firsthand. Once I received my sentence, I probably wouldn't have gone around telling people about the app. Doing so would inevitably lead others into the same sh situation we're in. On the other hand, some human test subjects might yield valuable insights into how the app works, so maybe he was low-key playing 5D chess with human lives. Either way, I would be doing everything I could to try and reverse engineer the app in the limited amount of time I had left. Again, the reviews would be a good place to start, and the app's listing should also include its creator, giving us another lead to investigate. You could even put out an Upwork or Fiverr contract to have some rent-a-geek try to hack in 
into it. If all else fails, you could try appealing to the App Store to have it delisted. This would at least spare some others from suffering the same mental anguish. Not sure they would actually go for it though. After all, it is working as advertised. I get that Evan's worried about dying during the operation, but I don't understand why he tries to flee the hospital. Evan knows Courtney wasn't able to escape her fate by choosing not to ride with him. You'd think he'd expect something unfortunate to occur at the exact time he was supposed to die while under the knife. If that's the case, then being in a sterile room surrounded by doctors and cameras seems like the best place he could possibly be. Instead of trying to leave the hospital, I would create some kind of commotion to get as many staff members around me as I possibly could, especially after seeing the shadowy figure in the mirror. From there, I'd probably have the best chance of surviving anything the universe could dish out. If a team of trained medical professionals in a 21st century hospital couldn't save me from whatever was about to happen, then I probably wouldn't fare any better limping down five flights of stairs myself. Also, it's not clear how the app defines death. Does it mean full-on brain death, or does your heart just have to stop beating? In the latter case, if Evan became clinically dead, but the hospital staff was able to revive him, wouldn't that technically resolve the situation? After all, he would still die at the exact time it said he would. He just wouldn't stay dead. Although I guess it could just as easily assign him another countdown. Unfortunately, once Evan found himself locked away in the main hallway, he was pretty much screwed. Okay, now it's Quinn's turn. Just like Evan and Courtney, she should have known better than to install this thing. Call me superstitious, but when someone tells me their girlfriend died at the exact moment predicted by a smartphone app, I don't download the app. Evan's story goes so far beyond mere coincidence that it would almost be a reasonable leap in logic to assume some kind of serial killer is involved with the app. We could be agreeing to have our phone's GPS data sent to a lunatic with a coding certification and an 8-inch hunting knife. Once we've received our predicted time of death, we can choose to either shrug it off and joke about it with our friends, or take it seriously and look into the origins of the app. If this time coincides with some kind of a life event, such as a trip or a party, we could assume that whoever created Countdown could have some kind of insight into our personal life. After all, Quinn heard about the app from someone local to her area. The programmers could be giving people they know short lifespans, and people they don't, longer ones. Now, it's up to Quinn to learn from Evan's mistakes. Upon learning of Evan's death, Quinn immediately recalls their conversation from the day before. She passes a speech check to gain access to his belongings, and finds his cell phone shattered but still operational. Unfortunately, it's also locked with his biometrics, which means a trip down to the morgue. Quinn opens up the cadaver cooler and pulls out the slab bearing Evan's remains. After some casual corpse defilement, she's able to bypass the facial recognition scanner and gain access to his countdown timer. It's zeroed across the board. Back at her desk, Quinn has become fixated on her rapidly dwindling lifespan. Her counter currently reads 1 day, 22 hours, and 53 minutes, which according to her calendar, places her time of death during the short trip she has planned with her father and teenage sister the coming Saturday. Connecting the dots between her scheduled family time and an early grave, Quinn reluctantly calls her father and asks if they can reschedule, which he's more than happy to accommodate. Thinking she's changed her fate, Quinn breathes a sigh of relief, but moments later, she receives a notification from Countdown. User agreement broken. I'm not sure risking her career or even criminal charges would be worth what Quinn was able to learn from Evan's cell phones. Although I suppose if there was still time left after he'd already died, that would call into question the app's accuracy. I would have definitely canceled my family plans upon realizing they aligned with my predicted time of death. But as we know from what happened to Courtney and now Evan, this would only be half the problem solved. If you really believe that the app displayed their exact times of death regardless of whether they tried to change their respective fates, that means we're still moving on a path towards certain death. I would fake a family emergency and leave work immediately, dedicating all my remaining time to learning more about the app and how to stop it. Finding someone with programming knowledge to explain how the app works at a fundamental level could reveal something we can use to our advantage. Now, if only we had read the damn user agreement, we might know exactly what we did to receive the violation notice, and what the consequences would be for doing so. Still, it's 
probably something we could find online provided enough people have taken an interest in it. Walking by an empty room, Quinn catches a glimpse of a shadowy figure out of the corner of her eye, but further examination reveals nothing out of the ordinary. A sudden tap on her shoulder nearly scares Quinn out of her shoes, but it's just Dr. Sullivan asking for help with a comatose patient. Sensing her underlying anxiousness, the doctor asks if she's okay. Quinn plays it off as just a little first day jitters, to which Dr. Sullivan responds by berating her with compliments and forcing her into an awkward hug hair sniff. He then decides the dimly lit bedside of an unconscious patient is the perfect place to plant one on her. The feeling isn't mutual. She manages to shove him away, and after a bit of nice guy whining, the doctor backs down, suggesting they just forget about it. Shaken up from the attack, Quinn immediately seeks out Nurse Amy to report Dr. Sullivan's behavior, but before she can explain what happened, the doctor calls the other nurse away for some urgent diagnostic work. Adding insult to injury, the countdown app once again reminds her she's violated its terms of service. Later that night, Quinn does some internet sleuthing to try and learn more about the countdown app, which she's apparently unable to delete. In doing so, she finds an article on Courtney's death, who she immediately recognizes from the wallpaper on Evan's phone. A comment on the article links to a vlog made by someone else who allegedly downloaded the app. The woman in the video claims she's been seeing things that just can't be, like her recently deceased cousin. In her final entry, she reveals that her time has run out before screaming a tear and dropping the phone. She concludes that the video must be a hoax and shuts her laptop, only to find a ghoulified Evan staring at her from the foot of her bed. In a panic, she runs for the front door, curb stomping the shit out of her phone in the process. Out in the front of her apartment building, Quinn climbs into the perceived safety of her car. The next day, Quinn heads to a local wireless store to pick up a replacement phone, preferably one that's not possessed. The store's manager, Tom Segura, offers to jailbreak it for an extra $100 off the books, but Quinn is more than satisfied when she sees no sign of countdown among her preloaded applications. As she's about to leave the store, Quinn hears the shrill scream of the countdown notification tone, looking down to find the malicious app having successfully installed itself on her new device. Realizing her attempt to escape the app has failed, Quinn snatches away the new phone and returns to her car. She catches the sight of the same cloaked figure in her backup camera. A second look turns up nothing, but then a pair of thick clawed hands grabs her from behind, causing her to stomp on the accelerator out of panic. Quinn's car speeds backwards into the side of a nearby Lexus. Before the situation can escalate further, a stranger from the cellular store rushes to her aid, chasing off the enraged motorist using a little tactical insanity. The newcomer's name is Matt, and he only has 18 hours and 30 minutes left to live. I don't know what Quinn's thinking here. It makes sense from a utilitarian perspective to replace the smashed up phone, but how in the hell could she expect it to solve all her problems? Even if the countdown app didn't magically transfer itself onto her new device, it would still exist on the other one. That's like throwing away a credit card bill to get out of paying it. It should be obvious now that she's dealing with forces beyond her comprehension, be they supernatural or technological. Given the shop owner offered to jailbreak her phone, it's reasonable to think that he might be able to figure out something about the app's programming. I'd have taken him up on the offer and then hung around to explain the situation in greater detail, since the pedestrian seemingly fails to notice the mysterious cloaked figure loitering in the parking area. We can assume the forces behind this are manipulating Quinn specifically. Knowing this, I would park my car and have a trusted person pick me up. The last thing we need right now is to wind up getting jump scared into oncoming traffic, or as it turns out, a parked car. Fortunately, Matt showed up before it could turn into an insurance claim. Quinn and Matt head to a local dive to drown their sorrows in reviewing the situation. They both remember being notified about violating the user agreement, which, of course, neither of them cared to read. Unfortunately, there is no way for them to go back and dissect the terms of service having already agreed. Instead of simply googling the missing document, they decide they'll have to find a useful idiot that they could trick into downloading the app. And the local crackpot seated down in the bar seems like an ideal candidate. Plus, Playing off the kook's obsession with all things conspiratorial, the two managed to get him to download Countdown, stopping him just short of accepting the user agreement so they can all read it together. Turns out, had they actually bothered to read what they were agreeing to, they would know that using the foreknowledge of their death to try and alter their fates would violate the terms and conditions. Matt then reveals he was planning to take a train to visit his aunt the next day, but cancelled after saying that's when he was supposed to die. With Quinn having done something similar, they realized the time shown on the app was truly meant to align with their actual time of death, and likely still does. 
So let me get this straight. You realize you fucked up by not reading through the terms of service agreement, and when you finally get another opportunity, you stop after the first three paragraphs and run off into the night. Maybe this is natural selection. The good news is they've at least figured out the meaning behind the user agreement notification, and in doing so, they have confirmation the countdown is meant to represent the actual amount of time they have left to live. This also suggests the forces behind the app are constantly monitoring their activities. How how else would it know when someone has deliberately taken action in an attempt to prevent their death? I would have taken a recording with my phone while scrolling through the entire thing. That way we could refer back to the complete document without sacrificing any more bar flies. Otherwise, who knows what kind of important information we could be missing out on. Quinn decides the best person to see about this matter is the hospital chaplain, who gives them the contact information for another priest that might be able to help. Matt takes the opportunity to use the men's room. Upon entering the stall, he's immediately treated to some spooky shit. The lights inexplicably shut off around him. He hears the sound of a crying child in a nearby stall, but upon investigating, finds nothing there. Just then, a voice from behind calls his name. Matt turns around to find his deceased younger brother lurking atop one of the sinks. The boy tackles him to the ground, seizing him by the collar and demanding to know where it is. Suddenly, the lights come back on, and as quickly as the episode began, it's all over, at least for now. As suggested by the chaplain, Quinn and Matt Matt arrive at the local church to meet an excitable young priest with a fascination for the demonic. The hyperactive holy man immediately becomes enthralled with her plight and quickly relates it to an ancient story of a similar nature. According to the legend, a cowardly prince sought out a fortune teller to find out whether he was going to die in a coming battle. Upon learning his death would occur during the fight, the prince decided to send his younger brother instead. This attempt at changing fate incurred the wrath of a demon by the name of Ozhin who would go on to torment the prince until his death at the exact time that was originally foreseen. Father John goes on to suggest the countdown app might be part of a modern day version of that very same predicament. All he needs to confirm this suspicion is an excerpt from the app's code. Remembering the offer to jailbreak her phone, Quinn and Matt return to the wireless store. They catch Tom Segura just as he's closing up shop, but manage to enlist his help by greasing him with their combined $2,300 worth of credit cards. Upon cracking into the app, it's shown to take a whopping 60 gigs of hard drive space. Further inspection reveals a healthy dose of Latin text in the source code, followed by names and countdowns of all current users. Seeing an opportunity to benefit himself, Tom uses his coding skills to add 60 years to his own countdown. The change is immediately reflected on his smartphone, giving Matt and Quinn the hope that they finally found a way out. While searching for Quinn's name, she discovers her little sister, Jordan, and the counter is three minutes shy of her own. She asks Tom to change her sisters first, lending her another 86 years among the living. All the way across town, Jordan receives the notification from the app, stating her countdown has been updated. Believing their troubles to be over, Matt and Quinn wave goodbye to the stand-up comedian as he leaves for a Tinder date. Unfortunately, Tom's date doesn't go so well, not because of his overt lack of charm, but because hacking the demon's app broke the all-important user agreement and picked it off enough to prematurely zero out his death timer. This brings the official body count up to three, and now it's down to only Quinn, Jordan, and Matt. Okay, 60 gigs? This thing takes like two seconds to download. Hopefully they have unlimited data. Given the app automatically knows the very instant someone tries to change their fate, they would all have to be profoundly stupid to think that this would go unnoticed. And since they neglected to read more than the first few lines of the user agreement, they have absolutely no idea what the consequences might be for a transgression of this nature. At the very least, I would still take the snippet of code back to Father John to have him decipher it. As far as everyone knows, this is Zero IQ play just made everything 10 times worse. Also, Mazin had license to torment Tom for 30 years after he went tampering with the app like that. Prematurely wasting him was a huge missed opportunity for prolonged suffering. Sorry, Tom. My question is, couldn't he do the same thing to Quinn and Matt? After all, hacking the countdown app was their idea in the first place. What's a couple days of lost torture when they're actively seeking a way to weasel out of their predicament? Quinn wakes up in the middle of the night to the sound of something rustling at her bedroom door. She 
tries to wake Matt beside her, only to find he's actually the one standing outside. Suddenly, the arm around her waist morphs into Ozens and drags Quinn under the covers. Matt quickly frees her from the mass of tangled sheets, but seeing nothing there, assures her it was only a nightmare. Just then, Quinn's phone screeches from the nightstand. Her timer has suddenly reset itself to the original time of death, and Matt's shortly follows suit. Back at Quinn's family home, Jordan picks up her phone to find her countdown has also reset, just like the others. Following his standard playbook, Mazen immediately begins screwing with the lights in an effort to frighten the teenage girl. Lacking any other option, Jordan crawls under her bed in an attempt to hide from whatever's lurking in the darkness. From out of nowhere, she hears the voice of her deceased mother calling her name. Suddenly, an unseen force drags the bed away, and Jordan finds herself face to face with her long dead parent. Thoroughly terrorized, she flees for the front door, reaching the exit just as Quinn and Matt come to rescue. Finally reunited, the three short timers tear ass back to the church to wake up Father John. Reading from a photo of the source code Quinn took while back at the wireless store, the priest determines that the app is part of a curse, which he believes can be broken. According to his encyclopedic knowledge of all things unholy, they just have to prove the countdown wrong to break its hold over them. Instead of bumping someone off before their time, Father John suggests they conduct a protection ritual to keep the demon at bay while they run out the clock. According to his reasoning, as long as they surpass the countdown by a single second, it should be enough to nullify the curse and save their lives. Of course, he's never actually done anything like this before. The priest's plan is to create a circular symbol on the floor out of salt, which, once blessed, should prevent the demon from crossing the perimeter. To ensure it can't simply be blown away, they mix a Costco drum of rock salt with house paint and set to work duplicating the design shown in the ancient text. Yeah. Despite Father John's confidence, I'd be thinking of a plan B right about now. From the sound of it, killing anyone before their projected time should be enough to nullify the curse, although it's not clear whether this hypothetical victim would have to be on countdown already. Technically, their death would be the result of us using the app, so that would place it ahead of whenever it was naturally ordained to be. Regardless, one would have to believe that Quinn and Jordan are likely to protect one another above anyone else. So if I were Matt, I'd be keeping an eye on them, and vice versa. If it looks like Father John's plan isn't gonna work, someone may have to take one for the team. The bailing hook on the wall of the church basement looks like it ought to get the job done. Sand. If I were Ozen, I'd be obstructing them at every step of the way at this point. He probably couldn't influence Father John, but Matt, Quinn, and Jordan have all violated their user agreements. We know from Matt's encounter in the hospital bathroom that the visions can physically knock them around. I'd be spawning in some dead relatives for a family-sized beatdown right about now. Sure, Austin supposedly can't kill anyone ahead of schedule, but that doesn't mean he can't use his powers to incapacitate or detain them until it's their time. I mean, dude, you're from hell. Shouldn't you be better at this kind of thing? Once their work is complete, Matt checks his phone to find only two and a half minutes until his time runs out. The group assembles inside the circle in anticipation of the showdown with death. As Father John begins reciting prayers to ward off any offending spirits, Jordan spots Austin as he emerges from darkness behind them. The demon attempts to cross the protective boundary, only to shriek as it catches fire. Momentarily thwarted, the dark spirit fades back into the shadow, instead opting for psyops over direct assault. A piercing, ear-splitting noise begins emanating from Matt's phone, deafening everyone but him. As he struggles to silence his device, he's struck by the sight of his younger brother, again, who then proceeds to lure him away from the others. As soon as Matt steps outside the circle, Ozen latches onto Matt's leg and drags him away from the church. The two sisters scramble after him, but are nearly crushed by flying furniture, leaving Jordan pinned between two shelves. Quinn manages to fight her way out of the basement and finds Matt walking around freely. Just as he proclaims they've beaten the devil's game, a rogue pickup slams into him at high speed, pinning him to a nearby tree. While lamenting the last-minute loss of their friend, Quinn notices a deep, bleeding wound on Jordan's abdomen, and the two immediately rush to the hospital. The app has claimed its fourth protagonist, with just two left on the clock. God damn. It. We literally had it. Plan A was actually working for once, but Matt just had to go chasing after his little brother, who he has known to be dead for years at this point. We should have known that Ozen would try and use mind tricks to manipulate us like he has all along. One thing's for sure, I would not, under any circumstances, have left the circle to go after him. We're in the fourth quarter here, and we have a plan that works. Trying to save Matt could leave us too gravely injured to prevent our own deaths. After all, Ozen might not be able to kill us until it's our turn 
turn, but that doesn't mean he couldn't break our backs with flying debris and torture us for what remains of our lives. From the looks of Jordan's puncture wound to her lower right abdomen and the rate of bleeding, it won't be fatal within the, well, let's say it took them five minutes to get to the hospital, where Quinn checked her phone, revealing 18 minutes left, and Jordan was three minutes faster. So yeah, Jordan only needed to hold out for 20 minutes to break the curse for good. More evidence the wound isn't fatal is that Ozen caused it and doesn't want to break his own curse. Then again, Ozen is an amateur. If Jordan does bleed out, well, <laughs> that breaks the curse too. Win-win. But I'm not a brand new nurse, so what do I know? If we had to go, I would have brought Father John with us. We could potentially try to recreate the protection ritual in a patient room, or at the very least, make use of his expertise during the final confrontation. After leaving her sister in the care of the medical staff, one of her fellow nurses stops her in the hallway, claiming she knows the truth about what happened between Quinn and Dr. Sullivan. In reliving her encounter with a doctor, Quinn remembers that he too downloaded the countdown app, landing himself a cozy 57 years. With less than 15 minutes remaining to spare her sister's life, Quinn sets out with a new plan. She barges into Dr. Sullivan's office, pouring on the charm and inviting him to the closed-off wing of the hospital so she can properly thank him for stitching up her sister. Though hesitant at first, Dr. Sullivan decides to take Quinn up on her offer. She ambushes him, working him over Gordon Freeman style until he's flat on his back. With her target immobilized, Quinn pulls out a syringe full of morphine and moves in for the coup de grace. But before she can land the killing blow, Jordan intervenes and begs her to stop. Suddenly, an unseen force drags the injured physician off into another room. It seems Ozen has become wise to Quinn's intentions and isn't about to let her disrupt his design. Quinn tracks Dr. Sullivan deeper into the restricted area. From out of nowhere, he launches an ambush of his own, socking Quinn in the face and disarming her. But before he can finish the job, Quinn returns the favor with a well-placed kick. Once again, Quinn winds up on top with a morphine. But just like before, Ozen foils her plan, knocking her away and giving the doctor a chance to escape. Elsewhere in the medical labyrinth, Jordan's time is running out. Hearing the sound of something approaching, she leaves her hiding place in a last-ditch effort to stay alive. Unfortunately for young Jordan, Ozen no stranger to hide and seek. The vindictive demon grabs onto the girl and heaves her through a nearby window. With only 50 seconds left, Ozen prepares to make Jordan's final moments a living hell. But before he can commence to torturing, Quinn calls out from down the hall. In a final bid to save her sister's life, Quinn holds the fatal dose of morphine to her own arm. Ozen responds by taking the form of the girl's late mother, attempting to dissuade her suicidal ideations by pulling on the heartstrings. But Quinn doesn't buy it. She presses down on the syringe and almost instantly loses consciousness. The defeated demon hoists Quinn into the air, shrieking in rage as life drains from her eyes. Having lost control over her fate, Ozen turns to ash, crumbling to the floor in a dusty heap. Jordan quickly rushes over to her sister, determined to bring her back from the dead. She then discovers the word Narcan written on her arm. Beside Quinn's body, Jordan finds a small vial of the life-saving substance, along with a fresh needle protruding from a pants pocket. Fortunately for Quinn, her little sister has a knack for Ikea instructions. Jordan administers the antidote, and within seconds, Quinn cheats death for a second time. It's hard to believe Dr. Sullivan made it through medical school being so stupid. Quinn's invitation is very clearly a trap, especially in light of recent events. I'm sure it was satisfying for Quinn to get a few licks in with the crowbar, but it was ultimately unnecessary and cost her an easy kill. I would have just snuck up behind him with a syringe, Agent 47 style. Hell, we could have just walked right up to him under the guise of getting frisky and stuck him in the neck while he was distracted. Doing so, we probably could have done the deed before Jordan screwed things up with her damned feelings and maybe even outsmarted Austin too. Clearly, Dr. Sullivan deserves to be punished for his crimes, but perhaps that should have been left up to the court of law. Ambushing him like this would only serve to undermine her case, and if she had succeeded in killing him, she may have saved her own life only to wind up behind bars. Quinn sticking herself with the morphine only to be revived afterwards seems like much more of an effective play. There's just a couple problems with this plan. First off, morphine overdose can take several minutes to put someone down for good. Because of this, it's unlikely Quinn would have fully succumbed to the effects in the 50 seconds left on Jordan's clock. The second problem is that Narcan can only stop someone from overdosing. It doesn't actually bring you back from the dead. In order for this plan to work, Quinn would have to enter sudden cardiac arrest, and the only way to bring her back at that point would be with a defibrillator. Since Jordan's countdown was three minutes ahead of Quinn's, this plan should have been executed immediately upon entering the hospital. I would tell Jordan what I was planning to do ahead of time and instruct her to call for 
for help and zap me with an AED as soon as I was clinically dead. Assuming Asun couldn't jab us with a Narcan before then, we'd be in the clear as soon as our heart stopped beating. Speaking of Asun, if I were him, I would have used my telekinesis to whip the syringe away while Quinn was standing around recklessly for no reason. If he can use his powers to drag a grown man across the floor, how hard could it be to rip a one ounce syringe out of someone's hand? Sometime later, the girls and their father visit their mother's grave in observation of her birthday. Having paid their respects, they turn to leave. But before they can drive off into the sunset, Quinn hears a notification come in. Countdown 2.0 is now installed. Damn, that's a downer, but as long as this new app operates under the same rules, we should be able to beat it just like last time. Well, maybe not just like last time. Obviously, we can't keep overdosing on pain medication every time we get a notification, but as stated before, the protection circle really seems like a viable option. As long as we can make it back there before our time is up, it should be a surefire way to keep Boston off our backs. Looking back on who might have survived, poor Courtney was pretty much screwed from the start. She had no way of knowing the app was legit. Shit. And even if she did, the short notice she received would have greatly limited her ability to react. Evan should never have downloaded the app after what happened to Courtney, and instead begun the investigation. Matt's death was absolutely preventable. All we had to do was keep him inside the circle, which was just a matter of reinforcing the idea of not trusting visions of dead loved ones, or just plain strapping him to a chair. Ultimately, Quinn and Jordan were able to outsmart Ozen and get another chance at life, but how they went about it calls into question the way Countdown operates in the first place. If Quinn could be revived by the Narcan, she couldn't have been clinically dead, much less brain dead. So where exactly does the app draw the line? Let me know what you think in the comments. In the end, I think the killer app from Countdown was beaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, read the terms and conditions of every app you download. Just kidding. Skip that shit and blindly accept your fate. We all know you're going to anyways.